Orson Welles was a giant of a man in every sense. Big talent, big personality, big achiever. In theatre, radio and films, Wells was one of the 20th century's dominant forces, a flamboyant figure who lived life to the full. Wells' masterpiece was, of course, Citizen Kane, which he directed at the tender age of 26. But he'd already established himself as a young genius and something of a maverick with the international success of the notorious War of the Worlds radio broadcast. He talks about it here in the 1955 episode of a BBC series called The Orson Welles Sketchbook. Well, we did on the show exactly what would have happened if the world had been invaded. That little music playing and then an announcer coming on and saying, excuse me, we interrupt this program to bring you an announcement from Jersey City. Jersey City has just fallen. Take you back to our studio, a little organ music and then another interruption and so on. We did all of that very carefully and exactly reproduced, as I say, what would have happened, thinking to make, make the whole thing more effective. But we had no idea how effective it would be because about halfway through the show, as we were continuing with the script in front of us, we saw that in the control room there were a great many policemen and every moment more. I had no idea that I'd suddenly become a sort of national event. And it was immediately after our show went off the air that Walter Winchell, who was on a, on a rival network and had heard about how all the telephone lines had been jammed and all the excitement was going on, went on the air on his network, on his program of news commentary, and said, Mr. and Mrs. America, there is no cause for alarm. America has not fallen. I repeat, America has not fallen. It's only a little while ago that I again ran into some workers, some, some, some welfare workers, Quakers and Red Cross people who had been up in the Black Hills of Dakota some five or six weeks after this broadcast, persuading the people to leave the mountains and go back home because the Martians really hadn't come. And uh, it was some, oh, I think, four or five years later, when I was on the air doing a show very polite show with a lot of people, choruses, singing, and so on. Well, that's a typical solemn Sunday broadcast on commercial sound radio in America at the time with full choir and orchestra and everything else. And for some reason at this time, this particular Sunday that I've illustrated, we were doing a patriotic broadcast with excerpts from Walt Whitman and I don't know what else, Norman Cohen, all the rest of it choirs humming melodically and so on, and I was in the midst of some hymn of praise to the American cornfields or something of the kind when suddenly a gentleman darted into the radio studio, held up his hand and said, we interrupt this broadcast to bring you an announcement. Pearl Harbor has just been attacked. Of course, this very serious and terrible news was never believed, not for hours, by anybody in America, because they all said, well, there he goes again, really. Rather bad taste was funny once, but not a second time. I suppose we had it coming to us because, in fact, we weren't as innocent as we meant to be. When we did the Martian broadcast, we were fed up with the way in which everything that came over this new magic box, the radio, was being swallowed. People, you know, do suspect what they read in the newspapers and what people tell them, but when the radio came, and I suppose now television, anything that came through that new machine was believed. So in a way, our, our broadcast was an assault on the uh, credibility of that machine. We wanted people to understand that they shouldn't take any opinion predigested and they shouldn't swallow everything that came through the tap, whether it was radio or not. But as I say, it, it was only a, a, a partial experiment. We had no idea the extent of the thing, and uh, I certainly personally had no idea what it would mean to me. As in fact, by my, my life, at, I'm now going back to the time of the actual broadcast, my life was uh, threatened. There was somebody, as a matter of fact, who kept telephoning about every quarter of an hour saying 
You will die on the opening night of your play. As a matter of fact, the opening night of my play was the night after the broadcast. It was a play called Danton's Death that we did in my theater, and which, incidentally, was a horrible flop. And at the end of the play, I had to stand in front of the curtain and deliver a speech in the character of Saint-Just on the subject of something, I think it was the French Revolution. Anyway, I had to be alone in front of the curtain in a blazing white spotlight. And I promise you that I've never been so terrified in my life. I had to come out in front of this audience waiting for the sound of a pistol being cocked, some angry uh, victim of our broadcast shooting at me, deliver this speech. But what actually, <laughs> what actually happened was that as I stood in front of the curtain, there was a little spill from the spotlight. I could see the front row in the audience. There was a man sitting in the front row who looked up at me. As I say, the play was a flop. People didn't like it, and they're probably right. A man who looked up at me as I opened my mouth to speak, raised his hand, looked at his wristwatch, looked at me, went... <sighs> and folded his arms. Well, I assure you that I would rather have been shot. <laughs> at least that's the way I felt about it. The notoriety that came with War of the Worlds had Hollywood throwing itself at Wells. He was offered a contract guaranteeing him total artistic freedom to make the film of his choice. What he chose was Citizen Kane. Wells co-wrote, produced and starred in Kane and his directing broke new ground, changing cinema forever. It wasn't a hit when it came out, but quickly came to be considered one of the great movies. And stories of how it was made continuously fascinate television interviewers and audiences. Is it true that when Citizen Kane was being made, that people actually tried to stop it being made? And is it true that Randolph Hearst, the newspaper tycoon, took it as being an attack on himself and tried to stop it when it was made being shown? To the first part of your question, there was indeed a, uh, a very definite effort to stop the film during shooting by those elements in the studio who were attempting to seize power, because in those days, studio politics, particularly RKO and indeed many of the big studios in Hollywood, were very much like Central American republics. And there were revolutions and counter-revolutions and every sort of palace intrigue, and there was a big effort to overthrow the then head of the studio, mm. who was taken to be out of his mind because he'd given me this contract, which made the making of these films possible. Mm. And stopping me or proving my incompetence would have won their case. He, uh, Mr. Hurst, was uh, quite a bit like Kane, although Kane isn't really founded on Hurst in particular. There are many, uh, peop many people sat for it, so to speak. But he was like Cain in that he wouldn't have stooped to such a thing. But he had many hatchet men, editors and representatives of this great network of newspapers all over the country. <laughs> and uh, to get in good with the chief, there was a good deal of very strong hatchet, including an effort to frame me on a criminal charge, which a policeman was good enough to tell me about. It's sensational and silly and dangerous and gangsterish is that. Was Mr. Hurst's staff absolutely wrong? I mean, when you say that it was based on that kind of man, was he really stronger in your mind than just being that kind of man? Well, let me ask you if you think he was libeled. Well, I don't know him, I see. I see, yes. Well, do you think that the figure of Cain himself is a deeply unsympathetic figure? In, in no. the Soviet Union, for example, the film has been forbidden general distribution because this important capitalist and newspaper tycoon and anti-social and crypto-fascist figure, etc., to quote all the slogans, is too sympathetic. And for that reason, it's not shown, never has been. Uh, when you read about Citizen Kane, a lot of the things you read suggest that it was a very big social document, a massive attack on big American institutions of the day. Now, I've always seen it rather as a story, to be honest. Naturally, any story has got its implications, but I've seen it as a story. I'd like to know what your intentions were. Did you mean it as a, as, as, as a social document or as a story? I, I must confess to having to... I, I must answer this in a way that I loathe. I must admit that it was intended consciously as a sort of social document, as an attack on the acquisitive society and indeed on acquisition in general. But I didn't think that up and then try to find a story to match the idea 
Of course, I think the, the uh, storyteller's first duty is always to the story. It makes it all the more ironic, doesn't it, that it should have been stopped in the Soviet Union. Yes, but of course it wasn't at all a communist picture or a Marxist picture. Mm. It was an attack on property and acquisition of property and... Uh, and the corruption. Yes, and the, of the acquisitive society of a man who... Uh, of real gifts and real charm and real humanity who destroys himself and everything near him because, uh, you know, tired old words, mammon and all, that really was, you know. Now, when you made this film, you were only uh, 25, weren't you? I mean, everybody knows that you had the most astonishing contract that Hollywood has ever provided, yes. ever, ever. Not, not financially speaking, in terms of authority and yes. rights. Financially, it wasn't extraordinary in any way at all. It was extraordinary in the, in the control it gave me over my own material. You had total control. Total control, so much so that the rushes, uh, which I, I perhaps should explain to, to, uh, mm. that are, yep. are, are the pieces of film that are shown at the end of the day's work, uh, as I'm sure you understand, and uh, are always checked by everybody in the studio, department heads and the bankers and uh, distributors and everything, long before there's a rough cut. But according to the terms of my contract, the rushes couldn't be seen by anyone. And indeed, the film couldn't be seen until it was ready for release. I got that good a contract because I didn't really want to make a film. Well, you better develop that. And you know, when you don't really want to go out to Hollywood, or at least this was true in the old days, or the golden days of Hollywood, when you honestly didn't want to go, yes. then, then the deals got better and better. In my case, I didn't want money. I wanted authority. So I asked the impossible, hoping to be left alone. And at the end of a year's negotiations, I got it. Yes. Simply right. because there was no real vocation there. My, my love for films began only when we started work. What I'd like to know is where did you get the confidence from to make ignorance. a film with such... Ignorance. Sheer ignorance. You know, there's no confidence to equal it. It's only when you know something about a profession, I think, that you're timid or careful. Or... How did this ignorance show itself? I thought you could do anything with a camera that the eye could do or the imagination could do. And if you come up from the bottom in the film business, you're taught all the things that the cameraman doesn't want to attempt for fear he will be criticized for having failed. Yes. And in this case, I had a cameraman who didn't care if he was criticized if he failed, and I didn't know that there were things you couldn't do. So I, anything I could think up in my dreams, I attempted to photograph. You got away with enormous technical advances, didn't you? Simply by not knowing that they were impossible, or theoretically impossible. Yeah. And of course, again, I had a, a, a great advantage, not only in the real genius of my cameraman, but in the fact that he, like all great men, I think, who are masters of a craft, told me right at the outset that there was nothing about camera work that I couldn't learn in half a day, that any intelligent person couldn't learn in half a day. And he was right. It's true of an awful lot of things. Of all, uh, you know, of, ev of every, of, you know, the, the great mystery that requires 20 years uh, doesn't exist in any field. And certainly not in the camera. And I'd just like to uh, look for a moment and uh, have a look at this clip. What I'd like to ask you about that, it's rather a technical question in a way. Uh, when you were making that sort of scene and making that sort of shot, did you ever feel nervous that maybe you'd gone too far? I put myself in your shoes. You see, if I'd made that, I'd be, I'd be terrified that I was just on the point of toppling over into fast, that I'd made the room too large. Uh, did you have this sort of anxiety? No, because the room is that big. What room is that big? Awfully pompous answer, his room. <laughs> yes, pompous question, perhaps. No, not at all. You're quite right, and I should have had that fear. 
But I do feel that a man like Cain is very close to farce and very, and very close to parody, very close to burlesque. And that's why I tried every sort of thing, from sentimental tricks to uh, an attempt at genuine humanity, to keep him always counterbalanced. But of course, anybody who could build a place of that kind, yes, you know, is very close to uh, low comedy. Not. Of course, he is. Sir. When uh, eventually Cain was made, it was an enormous success, as all the world knows, and it's gone on being a success, and it's a long time ago now. Have you ever regretted that so great a success came so early? Well, I've regretted uh, early successes in many fields, but uh, I don't regret that in Cain because it was the only chance I ever had of that kind. I'm glad I had it at any time in my life. I wish I had it more often. Mm. I wish I had, uh, you know, a chance like that every year. There'd be 18 pictures. Yes, not just one. Yes. Two, Ambersons. Two, except Ambersons. The end of it, uh, there's a, a very serious piece of surgery involved there, change. Which wasn't done by you? No. There's, there are two short scenes I... in it I didn't write or direct, and uh, over three reels were taken out in their entirety, and they were in my view, the reason for making the film, not simply good reels, but the whole film was a preparation for those reels, which were too tough and too... Uh, in those days, too hard-boiled for the exhibitor's taste. And by the time I returned from South America, that's a long story I won't go into, to supervise the release of Ambersons, Archeo had fallen into the hands of the counter-revolutionary forces. And I no, no longer was invited into the cutting room. You've been denied the cutting room before. I Several mean, just, times, just yes, recently, on a, on, a, on, a, on a touch of evil. Yes, that's happened really quite often to, to extremely uh, uh, individual filmmakers. I'm not saying uh, it isn't a qualitative thing. It's a it's a style, and there's a certain kind of filmmaker who really wants to make the film entirely on his own. And that sort of fellow is the sworn enemy of the system. So well, the there, system and, is, and yes. the system is at great pains to denigrate such a person. Not only myself, but many people like myself. And that's happened in Russia as well as here in America. It's happened in England. It's, it happens everywhere in varying degrees. Seeing that this yeah. sort of thing happens... Uh, they rightly what? regard the artist as the enemy of, uh, of their profession, you see. Yes. What do you think of Hollywood, Orson? I'm not at all against Hollywood. Not at all. It's a, it's a, uh, I think, a remarkable community with a great history uh, and a very entertaining place to work in. The obvious things against it are so obvious there's really no need to list them over again. Anything you can say about Hollywood is true, good and bad. There's no extreme statement that doesn't apply. I have heard it suggested that Citizen Kane is in some sort of sense autobiographical. The notion that Kane himself is some sort of version of myself, uh, I, I'd really fail to recognize. Maybe out of blindness, but it seems to me that Kane is a... Uh, uh, everything that I'm not. Good and bad. <laughs> After Citizen Kane and the magnificent Ambersons, Wells fell out with the studios. He directed his estranged wife, Rita Hayworth, in The Lady from Shanghai, but it was a financial disaster. The rest of his career would see him struggle to make the films he felt passionate about, funding his own productions with money earned from acting roles. It was on the 1959 film Ferry to Hong Kong that I got to work with him and found him to be funny, warm, generous and sometimes difficult. And he was a great storyteller, as he demonstrates here, talking about his childhood with David Frost in 1970. Who had the, the greatest influence on you, your, your mother or your father? My mother. I, she died before my father did. She died when I was eight, but uh, no question about it. She was an absolutely extraordinary woman. She sounds fantastic. She was, she was an imprisoned suffragette. Yes, and, she, a, and, and pacifist. She was a violent radical. A uh, great concert pianist and beauty. She was one of those uh, uh, crack, crack shot. Crack <laughs> shot. Everything, you know. She really was quite super lady. That's incredible. Yeah. And in fact, you were reading fluently when you were two, according to one. No. Of... 
Not true. Of course not. No? 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 <laughs> when I was three. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Were you... They, <laughs> they also say you... You'd memorise speeches from King Lear by the time you were seven. Is that true? I don't know. Maybe I had. It, it doesn't seem the right part at that age. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but of course, I began my career pretending to be older than I was because I started, I was just 16, and I pretended to be 25. And the, I played 60-year-old uh, men. That was an eye. So I suppose I was getting in practice when I was doing Lear at seven, if it's true. You also, you also threatened, is this true, that you once threatened because of music lessons to throw yourself out of a hotel window? Did yes, you? that was, uh, again, that was my mother. Uh, I'll show you the kind of strength of character she had because we were in the Ritz Hotel and uh, she didn't give me the piano lessons because of the exercises and all that. She's got a lady in, in this case it was a poor unfortunate spinster and I saw I could bully her, you know. <laughs> So I said, I don't want to do any more scales, and if you make me do another scale, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> and the spinster, you know, really fed me so well on that that I, uh, when another scale was asked for, I went out, and there's a balcony. And I climbed over the balcony and stood like this, holding, you see, over the thing. And when you're very young, you don't believe in death. All you see is the people standing around and saying, now we're sorry. You know? Yeah. You know? Oh, we shouldn't have done that to him. You don't think you're going to suffer, they're going to suffer. So I was ready to go, you know. And this poor music teacher ran into my mother, who was in another, another room, and said, he's out there, he's going to jump, he's going to kill himself. And my mother thought to herself, if I come in and run at him, he might be idiotic enough to jump. So I just heard this voice from the other room, which said, well, if he's going to jump, let him jump. <laughs> and my mother had the strength of character enough to say that. And she told me the story later, and she waited. It was a long pause, and then she heard, da da dee 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 And it was in Ireland you first acted, wasn't it? Yes, that was to get out of school. I had a scholarship for Harvard. I'm a dropout. And uh, the only way, I'd been painting in Ireland, and it got to be winter, and uh, the days were getting short, and so was my money. And I knew I was going to have to go back to America and go to this dreaded school of learning. So uh, I went backstage to the Gate Theater and told them I was a famous star from the New York Theater Guild. And just as the, for the fun of it, I'd like to stay with them and play a few leading roles. <laughs> now, you can only do that if you don't believe that it matters, if you don't care. I had no desire to be an actor. If I had, I would have said, could I have a spirit to hold? You know. But because I didn't think it was, it was ridiculous that I would be an actor in my life, so I just said, I am a leading actor. Why not? And I began as a leading actor. I played a star part the first time I ever walked on the stage. And I have been working my way down ever since. He was joking there, but Wells did have his downs, with films that flopped and a long list of projects that never got off the ground. But he always bounced back. And as new generations of film fans came to his early works for the first time, his reputation grew a fact he discussed in an interview with Michael Parkinson in 1973. I asked you that question about heroes, actually, because I know to a, to a lot of people that, that you, you know, if I asked them that question, they would say that you were their hero. I can't imagine why, but I love hearing it. You love hearing it. I that, sincerely you? don't know why. I sincerely can't see how anybody could make a hero of me. I, I, but, uh, as I've never yet been called it, I must ask you this, and you've been called it many times, you've been called a genius many times. Yes, yeah, so it's just one of those words, you know. It's one of those words. I suppose there have only been two or three geniuses in this century. We all know who they are, you know. Really? I suppose, yes. What, Einstein and Picasso and somebody in China we haven't heard about, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you don't accept the... Uh, oh, I accept the, anything <laughs> I get. <laughs> but, uh, but between friends, you know, there aren't many of them. No. And I, I, really wouldn't, I really wouldn't want to try to edge my way into uh, an elevator 
that uh, for geniuses only <laughs> going up, you know. <laughs> well, let's go. Back. You were talking earlier about, about experts and their idea. I suppose you take your experts, I would be. Uh, Film critics would be would call themselves experts, one imagine. Now they've judged a film of yours twice running the best film ever made. Now how do you That do you shows you how crazy experts are. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, it shows you how fundamentally sound film criticism is in this <laughs> day and age. <laughs> no, I don't I, I never talk about critics because uh, there isn't anything to be said about them. If they if they criticize you, anything you say is sour grapes. And if they like what you do, you should shut up. You know, it's it's uh, it's uh, there's no way of criticizing the critics. Do they ever They're immune. Do they ever wound you deeply? Yes. Any really? I can remember every bad notice I've ever had. Really? I can remember one I got when I was 18 years old in in Salt Lake City when I played Marsh Banks with Catherine Cornell, and I was described as a sea calf whining in a basso profundo. <laughs> and I'm sure it's an absolutely accurate description of that performance, which must have been abominable, but it still goes through my head before I go to sleep at night, along with a thousand other litanies of the same kind. I have a <coughs> misfortune, is that I, uh, I, 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 it isn't out of modesty, it's I suppose some form of, of masochism, if so it's the only thing that I'm masochistic about, but I do remember all the bad notices and I do forget or, or uh, take not very seriously the good ones. Yes. And the other curious thing is that you genuinely do not like talking about your work in movies at all. No, about because film. it's yeah. done. I really don't. You yeah. know that. That isn't because we've got cameras on no, us. No. I, I really, no, no. I, I'm a good... I, my family has never heard me say a word about any picture I've no. ever made. I just find you that know? very, very curious yeah. indeed. Because, you know, the number of people I have interviewed, film directors, film actors particularly, I mean, that's all they can talk about. Well, I'm sure they can talk about things, but they like to talk about it. A lot of directors and actors like to run their movies, you know. Their idea of a happy night at home is to turn on the projector and see one of their pictures again, you know. <laughs> and I can't think of anything more horrifying, <laughs> you know, because you can't change it. Yes. What can you do about it? Yes. There it is, yeah. forever. And if you're, you know, if you're a writer and you've written a bad chapter, and they're going to bring out another edition. If you're lucky enough of your works, you get to fix up that chapter. Nothing you can do about a movie. There it is, locked in forever. Yes. You know? Yes. But of course, you, 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 you will talk generally about, about movies, not your own, yes. about the industry. Yes, I'm not as interesting about it as I'd like to be, though, because I don't see enough movies. No, no, no. But I was, I was just wondering about the, the changes that you've seen in the, in the industry since you first started making movies in, in Hollywood. There have been this most radical... Do you think it's still an industry, Michael? Uh, really oh. an industry. It's not an industry like it used to be, that's no. for sure. And I wonder if it really was. I think it was a kind of, I think it always was show business, and that when there were big studios, which still existed when I went to Hollywood, and were, but were in their very last days, as golden age big studios, I think they were pretending to be factories, and it was still show business. It's true they were grinding them out and all that, but it's show business. The true industrial process cannot be as, uh, as helter-skelter and idiotic as every form of show business is. Otherwise, you know, every car we'd get in would break down after the second block. <laughs> I can't believe the rest of the people are as stupid as we are. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, but then, but, but how do you get the product then if it's all as mad as that? I mean, uh, well, in those it days? sort of happens. It sort of happens, you know. Movies are terribly easy to make. It's much harder to put on a play eh? than a movie. Oh, yes. Eh? You see, because the minute, uh, what's hard to do is to make a very good movie. Yes. A good movie is even easy to make because if you have a good cameraman, if you have the, the cast that happens to be right, if you have a story that happens to be vaguely interesting, that is the art form that works in our day and age. So that uh, it would be very hard to write a great play in blank verse today, but I think it was pretty easy in Elizabethan days to write a good Elizabeth, uh, to write a good verse play. Yes. Not a great one, but a good one. Yes. And it's uh, damn near impossible now because it has nothing to do with our culture. Yes. But somehow a good movie gets itself made even by a lot of second rate people. Yes. You know? Yeah. A very good one is, of course, another, another thing. Yes. 
What about the, the, the thing that has changed, of course? Uh, um, I'm sorry, I did really answer your question. You're you talking about changes. About changes. I went wandering well, off. All I, all I really wondered about was that when, if you look back at those days in Hollywood when you were first operating over there, and it really was the dream factory, yeah, wasn't yeah. it? And this other thing. You, when you look back, I mean, are you nostalgic about those days, or are they just, as, were they just comic relief? I loved them. Did you? You know. I thought it was great, you really? know. So I never belonged to it. You see, when I came, I was this terrible maverick that they all, you know, I was, uh, I represented, I was sort of the, you know, 40, 30 years ahead of my time, whatever it is, there was a sort of ghost of a Christmas future. There was the one beatnik, you know, there was this guy with a beard who was going to do it all by himself, you know. I represented the terrible future of uh, what was going to happen to that town. So, uh, I was hated and despised, uh, theoretically, but I had all kinds of friends among the real dinosaurs who were awfully nice to me. Really? Uh, yes, and I had a very good time. But I believe that I have looked back too optimistically on Hollywood because my daughter has a, has a group of books about Hollywood that she bought. I don't know why, probably vainly looking for references of her father in them. <laughs> And uh, I took to reading them lately, and I realized how many great people that town has destroyed since its earliest beginnings. How almost everybody of merit was destroyed or diminished, and how the few people who were good who survived, how what a great minority they were. And I suddenly thought to myself, why do I look so affectionately on that town? It was because it was funny, and it was gay, and it was an old-fashioned circus and uh, everything that we're nostalgic about made it funny and gay when it was really happening yes. but really it was a brutal place yes and when i take my own life out of it and see what they did to other people i see that the story of that town is a dirty one and its record is bad one reason well survived hollywood was the magnetic quality he had as a performer his presence and that rich voice meant he commanded every scene. This was perhaps best demonstrated in one of his most famous roles, Harry Lyme in The Third Man, which he discussed in an arena special from 1982. What kind of a spy do you think you are, Satchel Foot? What are you tailing me for? Cat got your tongue? Come on out. Come out, come out, whoever you are. Step out in the light and let's have a look at you. Who's your boss? You're so dead, no one was eating that loose. Sounds was called in your rap, Dane. Sind Sie deppert? Ja, Sie meine ich. Schauen Sie nicht so blöd. Eine Frechheit ist das, mitten in der Nacht zu einem Krawall zu machen. Harry! Eine Frechheit ist das, zu einem Krawall zu machen. Yes, you were saying about uh, about it being rare for for uh, directors to, to to be very fond of actors and acting, and I was saying that uh, Carol Reed, uh, nobody ever loved acting more than he did, and and was passionately interested in uh, in uh, his actors and in the process of acting, without the remotest feeling that he was imagining himself in that position or imposing himself. He was the real actor's director. His joy was in your work, not in seeing something of his come to life. He was exceptional in that case. And did he invite uh, your collaboration? Oh, yes, he invited out. everybody's collaboration, as I do. That's why I loved working. His style was so much like mine in the respect that he wanted he wanted uh, any suggestion he could get. I, I always, I, the, the, you know, I've, I can tell you scenes in, in, uh, in pictures of mine that were suggested by members of the crew. 
You know, anybody can make a suggestion. That doesn't mean they get to have it in the picture, but if it's good, it goes. Oh. And he welcomed it. And uh, so that uh, at an earlier time when I was being in, interviewed in another language, I gave the impression that I'd somehow co-directed my scenes with, and that's not true. And uh, I never meant to say that or give that impression. Uh, I was, however, to a large extent, the author of the dialogue of Harry Lyme, including the cuckoo clock and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Don't be so gloomy. After all, it's not that awful. Well, what the fella said, in Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love. They had 500 years of democracy and peace, and what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. So long, Holly. But that is what I do when I act in other people's pictures. I never argue about the direction, but I usually come up with a rewritten scene. That's the headache they have to put up with. And then if they don't like it, I'll go back to the other. But I, I, I go back home at night and write next day's scene, hope they'll take it instead of what it is. But I never would tell a director, would you do that or something, unless do, they asked me. Do directors often tell you how to do things when you're acting? Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. Or, 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 or uh, I had one director in, in, in England who yeah, was wonderful. About half the way through every take, he'd say, Cut. <laughs> Cut. There'd be a long silence, and I'd look at him, you know. I'd say, How would you like me to do it? Just, just do it again. So we'd do it again, and then there'd be this. Cut. <laughs> we went through the whole picture like that, and I never, I never knew what was giving him this pain. <laughs> Have you found yourself turning down, really, substantial parts because you wanted to get on with directing? No, I haven't been offered them. I would have sold my soul to play The Godfather, for instance. You know. But I never get those parts offered to me at all. Why, why have you accepted so many parts, no matter how well you may have done them in the end, that were uh, basically live. from bad scripts? To live. I have to live in the, you know, if you're, if you're, going, to, if you're going to try to uh, finance movies and live, you have to earn your money somehow. And I've done, most of my movies have been movies I didn't want to make. I've never done a movie that I disapproved of morally. The last star part that I was offered was Caligula. And I refused it on moral grounds. And yet there I would have been playing uh, the leading part in an $8 million picture. And it would have been nice to do that, but I, I didn't even have a moment's doubt about not doing it. And the same thing would be for a political reason or anything like that. I've turned down a lot of things for those kind of reasons. But no great parts. I haven't had any great parts offered me, only a few good ones in all these years. They hire me to, they hire me when they have a really bad movie and they want uh, a cameo that'll give it a little class, you know? So every time I do one of those things, I chip off something more from me as an actor. It's a kind of, you, you know, you're in liquidation when you do that. And that's why I hope to avoid it. Now it looks as though I have a chance for to direct a couple of more movies. And I've got a couple of good parts I've written for myself. It's the only, <laughs> only way I know how to get them. Else will. Yes. So I, I played all the great parts in the theater by, by running. You know, there's an old, old Yiddish saying in the Yiddish theater that the star is the man who owns the store, you know? <laughs> so some of my stores have been rather uh, small establishments, but I, I was the star. <laughs> because I owned it. I think I, I made a, uh, essentially a mistake in staying in movies, because I, but it, it's the mistake I can't regret because it's like saying I shouldn't have stayed married to that woman, but I did because I love her. 
I would have been more successful if I hadn't been married to her, you know? I would have been more successful if I'd left movies immediately. Stayed in the theater, gone into politics, written anything. I've, I've wasted the greater part of my life looking for money and trying to get along, trying to make my work from this terribly expensive paint box, which is a, a movie. Yeah. And I've spent too much energy on things that have nothing to do with making a movie. It's about 2% movie making and 98% hustling. It's no way to spend a life. Do you feel that's going to go on? Oh, I'm going to go on being faithful to my girl. I love her. I fell so much in love with making movies that the theater lost everything for me, you know. I'm just in love with making movies. If he'd never made a movie after Citizen Kane, Wells would still have gone down in cinema history. But that love of filmmaking was with him to the very end. Three years after that interview, at the age of 70, he died from a heart attack at his home in Hollywood. The man who made the perfect picture when he was 26 was found at his typewriter where he'd been working on a new script, doing what he loved best, right up to his final moment. <laughs>